Today's video is sponsored by Copilot. Woke, a word that has come to be meaningless due to the mainstream abusing that word like a woman in the 1990s. Yet so much of discourse from the right side of the internet is about being anti-woke, complaining about how things like diversity and feminism are ruining things, especially pre-existing IP that was made for men. I have been an active part of fandom since I was around 15 years old, and I have to say, it wasn't exactly great before, but it is definitely getting worse. Add on to that reactionary marketing, trying to push back against racists, and a general lack of media literacy, we have one of the worst climates to adapt a massive piece of fantasy IP into the mainstream with any intention of adding diversity for good or for evil. Enter The Witcher. Fuck. I'm waiting to drink this. I like got it at Hex and Co at Union Square forever ago. And um, let's see. Tastes like not beer. There are a lot of shows I could use for this discussion, but The Witcher, it's, it's special. I've talked about The Witcher back in season one a couple years ago, but for those uninitiated, the show is based on a popular series of books by Andrzej Sapkowski that got even more popular after the release of The Witcher games, of which there are three, and apparently there is a remake coming, so it's just gonna continue to get popular. And I just got a news alert earlier that there is gonna be a board game as well from the same people who do the game, so, there's a lot of other Witcher media outside of the show and the books. Originally, the books were gonna be squished into a film, but Netflix was persuaded into doing a television series that went into production in 2017. This is the second adaptation of The Witcher. There was also a show in Poland called The Hexer, which was an adaptation of it. In December of 2017, it was announced that Lauren Schmidt Hisrich would be adapting the series and serving as the showrunner. Before working on The Witcher, she had written for The Defenders, Daredevil and Power, which I, I I apologize to my black audience, I have not watched it. I don't care for that 50 cent. Henry Cavill, Henry, Henry Cavill was cast in September of the next year, having heavily complained for the role of Geralt because he's a fan of the video games. Later, Freya Allen and Anya Schultra were cast as Princess Cirilla and Yennefer of Vanderberg. From the very start, you could see complaints about the casting for Ciri and Yennefer for typical reasons, but the division between fans and general audiences started in season one and got even worse after season two. I lay out all of this backstory for one simple reason. There are many, many legitimate points about the failure of The Witcher show as an adaptation. The problem is most of the works discussing them are filled with like these alt-right dog whistles that are hyper divisive on YouTube. Like before I started The Witcher book club on Patreon, which, you know, slight plug of the Patreon. It's really cool. We cover a lot of really fun stuff on it. We have movie nights, pilot watches, watching commentary, uh, where we get to talk and watch fun things. And we also have a book club and currently we have been reading the Witcher novels and it has been really fun. But before I did that, I generally tried to look for nuanced takes about what made the adaptation so bad. And even the best ones I saw, there was always some small layer of sussness, either around the diversity or about the showrunner herself, of which there was plenty to critique about, but there was this instinctual way of saying that because was woman, equal to why was bad. But all of that is why I decided to read the books for myself. And I really like them. I think that Andre Shepkowski created a really fun, engaging and compelling world. It also showed me that a lot of people hyper criticizing the show as an adaptation of the books are also missing out very much on the progressive themes of the books themselves. And I think that is what's so interesting about The Witcher in particular. A lot of these people who really hate the show and blame diversity and feminism and inclusion and wokeness in general about why the show is bad, it doesn't often feel like they've read the books at all, really. And again, I've only played The Witcher, Wild Hunt a little bit. I am not trying to be an expert about the game, but as for the show itself and the books, yeah, I think there's a lot of lack of comprehension going on there. I think the best character to explore this difference in the discourse is gonna be Yennefer of Vanderburg, who in the books is a white character and has been race bent due to the actress as being half 
Indian. And I don't want it to come across as though I'm just attacking these, you know, video essayists or video commentators blindly, that I'm doing it just out of malice. So I'm going to be fair and start with the problem that the show has and how it interprets Jennifer. A few months ago, an already infamous quote came out from casting director Sophie Holland that appeared in an article for Variety. The question was, are there specific examples where you found someone or fought for them in a role? Holland said, I mean, that has become sort of a calling card of mine. I am always the first to champion diversity in all its glory. One that springs to mind was the casting of Yennefer on The Witcher. Lauren Schmidt Hissridge is the showrunner and we work so well together and she's so open to conversations. In the book, she is described as the most beautiful woman in the world. This was a few years ago and I'd like to think things have changed. But when you think about people's unconscious bias, especially in the fantasy world, it felt like these worlds were primarily white. And I remember saying, quote, I feel like we need to challenge what people think of as the standard of beauty. And having a woman of color in this role does incredibly powerful things to the people watching." End quote. <sighs> now, this is an unfortunate quote for a myriad of reasons, but let's start with the least offensive, which is that Yennefer in the books is a regulation hottie for sure. She's described as having, quote, a pale triangular face, violet eyes, narrow, slightly contoured lips appearing beneath black tresses. She had pretty shoulders, a shapely neck, and around it a black velvet choker with a star-shaped jewel sparkling with diamonds. We love it. Blinged out. Great. Beautiful purple eyes, a fantasy favorite. Hot girls have purple eyes in fantasy. We know this. But let's just go a few pages further into Geralt's viewing of Yennefer. Quote, he saw her left shoulder slightly higher than her right. Her nose, slightly too long. Her lips, a touch too narrow. Her chin, receding a little too much. Her brows, a little too irregular. Her eyes, he saw too many details, quite unnecessarily. So in the books, Yennefer is beautiful, but also dangerous. Like this dark, intense, creature with imperfections. And one of the things I said about the sorceresses that make up the world was the Witcher is that they are made up of formerly ugly girls who have a lot of resentment about their lot in life and use the magic to make themselves very beautiful, which flex, love that for them, love that they're just a bunch of bitter former ugly girls that are now artificial hotties and they're going to stun about it. It's great. But that's the thing about Yennefer's beauty. It is artificial. It's giving... Amber Sweet from Repo de Genetic Opera, but less extreme. It's another way that she and Gerald are similar. The things that give them power, which is her magic, also included things being taken away from them and shaped into them. The other thing that I think is very frustrating about what the casting director said, and I think the most egregious thing, is the idea that she was pushing past conventional beauty norms by casting a woman of color in the role. Now, let's be fair. Anya, gorgeous, beautiful, elegant, you know, like stunning on every corridor. She's still like a, a medium to light skin, mixed race Indian woman. That is not even in the paradigm of even as a woman of color, she's already in like the most attractive variant of that thing. Like it's excluding colorism, which is gonna mean a lot because there are a lot of dark skin characters in The Witcher. They just don't get to do nearly as much as their white versions do. But the idea that you cast a woman of color to subvert beauty expectations and wording it that way ignores the fact that like women of color are beautiful. Them being put into the norms of being the most beautiful character on earth is not a flex, especially when the character's beauty is literally <laughs> from magic and not actually like a, you know, a natural Guinevere, or, you know, even a Cersei Lannister type beauty. It just feels in a lot of ways. And I don't think that the casting director means negatively by it. I wanna just make that very clear. But what it reads as is sort of like someone who's trying to be an ally in their position, but also not necessarily understanding all the nuances of that position. Like it is great that Yennefer is a woman of color and gets to be the love interest in a story, even though she's already slim, able-bodied, lighter skinned. Those things are all gonna be a part of it. But then you also have a character like Fringilla who does sleep with Geralt in the canon, but they don't do that. So you make this character that does have this romantic subplot, a dark skinned character, but then rip away their sexuality at the same time. Those are the nuances that a lot of these white people in the background don't get while they're congratulating themselves for like making diverse choices. 
to me, I would say, was there a person of color in the room with you? Because just you and another white woman are making these decisions. Who is that empowering? You're always coming into it with your own expectations of what diversity and marketing looks like. And you ended up choosing the most attractive kind of woman of color to be on your poster, which is, again, not shade to the actress. It is not her fault that that is the reality of what she looks like. But casting directors can't pat themselves on the back for casting diversely and changing beauty standards when they're not aware of the beauty standards within the communities that they're trying to like market towards. In comparison, let's go to the other side of the discourse. And uh, I don't wanna put this particular creator on blast, so I'm not going to name them because I have a bigger platform from them. I wanna be responsible with it. And I'm not doing this to drag this person inherently, but I do think that this is exactly what I think about that lives rent free in my mind when I think about how, oh, there's a lot of reading discourse happening. Yennefer is an inherently unlikable character. She was designed that way very explicitly by Sapkowski. As he puts it, when I created Yennefer's character, I wanted Geralt to fully grow, but then I decided to make things complicated. I created a female character who refuses to be a fantasy stereotype to please the reader. That's not what that quote says. Like, even if you as a reader, player, etc. feel like Yennefer is unlikable for a lot of reasons, that's your opinion. That's totally fine. But that is literally not what that Sapkowski quote says. Let's, like, let's just repeat it real quick again. When I created Yennefer's character, I wanted Geralt to fully grow, but then I decided to make things complicated. I created a female character who refuses to be a fantasy stereotype to please the reader. As a character, she is supposed to upset us, frustrate us, and anger us. To take that line and assume that making a character that doesn't appeal to the male gaze means she's difficult to like is a wild take in my opinion because it only highlights the major difference between like the creator who's writing this work in a very subversive way and the way in which the audience is so used to the traditional way of fantasy that that subversion must mean oh I shouldn't like them like that's wild to me it's wild because what I take him to say in that quote is that he didn't want to give Geralt a passive female love interest whose only purpose was to warm his bed soothe his fears and have no other ambitions because he's talking about the fancy stereotype he's talking about the noble virginal kind archetype that people think of when they think of what a female love interest looks like for a hero in fantasy, which Yennefer is very much not, which is why she's the best. She's never done anything wrong in her entire life. In the books and in the game, from what I have played of it, both characters have this inability to communicate at all, Yennefer and Geralt, and that's what stops them from having a meaningful relationship. Yennefer is a really fun character because she is arrogant, prideful and stubborn while also being at times kind, loving and wise. She doesn't exist just for Geralt or Ciri just to be a, you know, a lover and a mother, but she would die for them. What I see in the interviews with the showrunner and people who work on the show and the criticism of Jennifer as a character from the anti-woke community is in a case of both a lot of projection about what it means to be a strong woman in fantasy. What does fantasy womanhood look like when you're trying to write a complex text? Now in season two of the show, there's a lot of changes made to Jennifer's character because she's not really a primary character in a lot of the stuff. There's an interview where Hesseridge says that Yennefer's journey in season two, the season where they depower Yennefer because otherwise she would have no role in that season because she's not in the book and at least a lot of horrible OOC-ness and it's really, really bad. This is what Hesper says of, of Yennefer. In season one, we watched her choose power over having a baby. The second that she gives up being able to have children, what she wants is to have children and she is then willing to give up anything to do that. I don't think that she sees things in a macro way yet. Her journey in the show is to realize that she does not actually have to give up being herself to also add this role of mentor mother figure to Siri. Her journey is about her realization that she can have all those things if she's willing to sacrifice parts of each of them. My advice to her would be to find your priorities without giving yourself up. I've always described my personal fulfillment as a puzzle. I need a lot of different things. I need to be a mom. I need a job. I need alone time. I need to write no matter what. I need to see my girlfriends and be lifted in that space. If one piece of that puzzle is missing, nothing feels good. It's only when all of those things are properly in place that I feel like I can truly shine. I think that's what Yennefer is getting to this season. 
I, I disagree. disagree. One of the things that's really interesting about the Witcher writer is that he's known for being very pro-choice and elements of that are very present in his books. There's an excellent thread about it that I will link down below and we'll put some screen caps about it. But the books are concerned with the bodily autonomy of its characters and the fact that as children and teens, both Yennefer and Geralt were put into positions where they would have no autonomy over themselves is an important part of who they are. It's not just Yennefer choosing to have a baby, is that she's brought to Eretuza, which is this, the group where she learns her to be a sorceress, as a child and graduates at 13. You know, aging her up is necessary in a series where we have fantasy elements of women having sex and violence at a very young age, but she didn't choose that like being taken as a young child and being shown that this is the way to get power is not the same as a choice plus in the same token that the show wants to have strong female characters it also makes the repercussions of not being a good wish that you get turned into like an eel which is very odd and not canonical to the books don't know where that came from sometimes the best thing a flower can do for us is die very suspicious. They also decided to make Yennefer go on screen through a hysterectomy in order to explicitly highlight her not being able to have children. When in the books, the inability to have children came as a natural side effect of having magic, which I think is a much better choice and kind of switches to a lot of duality between like magic and power and what it does to the body. I think that's a really interesting thing versus you know, going through a hysterectomy and making all of us watch it. There's a desire to take the feminist politics and radical aspects of The Witcher that are both text and subtext and bring them to the surface on the show. And that's a good instinct, in my opinion. The problem is that rather than take what's already there and fits, they keep adding and subtracting different things that can only really harm. Like the powering Yennefer to challenge her journey into becoming series mother is not just bad writing but it also plays into the trope of depowering female characters and like making their entire identity about being a mother that's not what Yennefer is all about add on to that that Yennefer is now a woman of color whose maternal identity becomes wrapped up in a white child they never think about these things when they adapt these stories they're always kind of like yeah just make them brown it's fine I have a patreon video about how not everyone can be black and it's the same thing for most other ethnic groups like you can't just make a character who is white black or brown without thinking about how it fits into everything else in your world like it can't be done just like that in certain cases it can work i think with percy jackson with annabeth i think it will be totally fine but in a show where like there's so much about sexuality and power and and race especially in terms of the elf stuff like you have to think about this stuff a little bit more at the same time the same video i mentioned before discusses that yennefer was not a victim of eratusa and that her mentors were not her enemies the show treats yennefer's pain as if she's the martyr of a bad system when really she's one of the lucky ones yen is someone who has gained a huge amount and profited a lot from the system. Clearly capitalizing on the political situation here. I'm serving the stifled people of this town. It's fine to fly in the face of overzealous authority, but to pretend it's anything other than making a profit. They may not have been her enemies, but they absolutely did victimize her and her mentors were not entirely good people. This is what Yennefer's own mother figure to say is about if Mages should even have children from Blood of Elves and I apologize for the ableist language. But in what Tisea says is that, quote, no one is born a wizard. We still know too little about genetics and the mechanisms of heredity. We sacrifice too little time and means on research. Unfortunately, we consistently try to pass on inherited magical abilities in, so to say, a natural way. Results of these pseudo experiments can be seen all too well in town gutters and within temple walls. We see too many of them and too frequently come across morons and women in catatonic state, dribbling seers who soil themselves, seeresses, village oracles and miracle workers, cretans whose minds are degenerate due to the inherited uncontrolled force. These morons and cretans can also have offspring, can pass on abilities and this degenerate further. Is anyone in a position to foresee or describe how the last link in such a chain will look? Most of us wizards lose the ability to procreate due to somatic changes and dysfunction of the pituitary gland. Some wizards, usually women, attune to magic while still maintaining efficiency of the gonads. They can conceive and give birth and have the audacity to consider this happiness and a blessing. But I repeat, no one is born a wizard and no one should be born one. Conscious of the gravity of what I write, I answer the question posed at the Congress in Sidaris. I ask most emphatically, each one of us must decide what she wants to be. 
a wizard or a mother. I demand all apprentices be sterilized without exception. Does that sound like a choice? Does that sound like someone who is a healthy mentor for someone who will eventually struggle with their own infertility? Is that a healthy thing to say about someone who is going to be the mother figure of a young girl with immense power in this world? Does that sound like someone in an institution that is healthy for anybody? No. <laughs> and that's the problem. Now, as I said before, at this point, I'm more familiar with the books and the games. So there may be something that I'm missing in comparison to what the gamers have seen. For me, what makes The Witcher interesting is how much it pushes back against the traditional fantasy conventions while still maintaining to have some level of optimism. Each character in our main trio is dealing with the weight of who they are versus what society says they are. The expectations of their role in the world. Geralt was left at the school of the wolf as a baby and became a very talented student. And when he first became a witcher, he was very excited, believing that it was a noble calling. And yet in The Last Wish, he details that the one time he tried to actually stand up and protect another woman, the father ran off and the girl was afraid of Geralt because he was a witcher. And as a witcher, he is seen as a marginalized, creepy person. He's a mutant. He is an outsider. And he is that way because of a choice that he never really got to make. He was dropped off as a baby, raised to be a witcher from childhood. There was nothing else he was ever going to be. And that experience created him to be sort of, you know, the equivalent of a, a centrist. And it isn't until he starts being more involved in the politics of the world that he realizes that that is not necessarily the best option in a world that is always changing. And I think that's what's so interesting is that people complain that the witcher is now woke when it's like, Geralt is literally a marginalized person. <laughs> You know, he literally like he he can barely make a living at times because there is less monsters in the world. The very occupation that his entire existence was, you know, given over to is one that's a dying breed of existence. You know, he's a child of surprise. He's all of these other things. And I think that's what's so interesting. You know, witchers are not knights. They don't have backing. They are this small group of people trying to help and are seen as more dangerous than monsters, you know? Yennefer was born with a hunch and was abused by her parents. She tried to self-harm when she was younger. She loves having power, but she was also forced to lose something without choice. Ciri is the princess of destiny, and so entire groups want to use her as a living, breathing plot device and womb for their own desires. All of these things are very... I hate to tell you, leftist, pro-choice, pro-bodily autonomy concepts. I mean, there's literally a scene in, I believe, Baptism of Fire where like they are encouraging one of the female characters to have an abortion if she so needs to because <laughs> Andrzej Sapkowski actually cares about these things. You know, everything written with like the elves and the, and the squirrels are all very much commentary on what it, on the programs and all of this stuff is very clearly in there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so weird people were like the show is woke now because the women and the gays ruined it literally uh dandelion aka jaskier being bisexual in the last season was like the best part of that entire very boring season of television i won't lie fundamentally i think the problem with the witcher as an adaptation is rooted in the fact that it came out after game of thrones game of thrones as a show had a lot of problems even from season one and how it decided to depict most, if not all of his female characters. Issues that wouldn't be clear to y'all at the time. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't have resentment. I just, you know. Anyway, it's not about that. It's not about that. In the aftermath of Game of Thrones, all the dialogue about race and gender and rape that came out of Game of Thrones, we have seen several shows try to take the mantle of being the more inclusive fantasy epic. You know, you get Rings of Power, Wheel of Time, The Witcher, House of the Dragon. Changes have been made with great intent in my opinion and I think solid ones but oftentimes have only led to the women and BIPOC folks in the cast who are part of the series being harassed and dragged for simply existing in the series themselves and the series themselves ranging from like okay to like mediocre to just like you know fine like enjoyable like a lot of the problem comes from the fact that rather than trying to adapt anything new anything modern that already has inclusion built into it they keep taking these pre-existing stories and changing them to fit new ideas 
but not caring about any of the things that make the story work and how to work that around diversity. And also just like, why don't they just adapt to more Pierce's series? They're already feminist, diverse, and queer. Why don't you just adapt things that already have the things that you want to have? Tomorrow, like, a lot of the lioness needs to be a series. Like, we don't need to do to, to adapting Rings of Power. Like, not that I, do, I like Rings of Power. I do. I do. But I'm just saying, like, you don't need to do all these things. Just, you can actually adapt things that already have diversity. What a cat said. Which I think is honestly preferable because the amount of backlash and hell that we get for existing in these series is, like, not worth it. It's not worth it. Like, getting harassed for being in House of the Dragon my own okay you know like for what for what make it very clear i am not against race bending inherently but so often it is less of a real storytelling technique or expansion and just adding literal color to an already white canvas there's no consideration of the realities of race in the world there is no attempt at adding like cultural layers or any kind of cohesion about like how these things would interact one of the things that's so upsetting about the witcher especially in like this last season it was driving me crazy like i was watching the witcher on discord with my followers and one of the things that made me so mad is like like the witcher is this in a place called the continent yet there is zero cohesion on how the world works in terms of like any of the like outfits and anything like if you take a still of any location in the witcher and you told me except for Karen morgan that place that looks that's legitimate that's fine that i can that, that that is clockable but if you were to tell me like a random castle is from a different show i would believe it and it's like we will go from moments where like a character like dykstra is wearing very like traditional western european era clothes to yennefer wearing whatever this like orientalist looking trash is and then also a shot where she has a fucking savage ex fenty bra on i know what that is wild can't believe they put her beautiful body in that her wig was already doing the most they was giving her so much volume i'm like what are we doing here guys it was it was horrendous I will say, whoever is doing the black hair on The Witcher, tens. Because Philippa was looking good consistently. All of her looks, outrageous, redonkulous. But also, like, again, the accents are inconsistent. It's like there's no sense of, like, cultural unity and you can have a blended culture you can have a culture because because the humans kind of like dropped in there you can have a multiracial society in the witcher but their society has to be in somewhere uniform it has to look like it exists together in a place called the continent <laughs> we also have a general fear of audiences not actually getting the point there is so little trust that audiences will be able to pick up on subtext which Honestly, the response from season one to season two of The Witcher kind of shows that that's true. And to be quite honest, I have found, especially like with Succession, that people are just really not good at understanding that like, just because you like a character doesn't mean that they're good. But it leads to, in a show like The Witcher, where everything has to be explicitly put on the surface, otherwise the message might get lost. In fantasy series, have a reputation while there's a lot of texts that earn that reputation i feel like it's also sort of ghettofied and i mean ghettofied in the academic sense not the sociological one and therefore there's this desire of like to make it work it has to do this and this and this which is so strange because they think about saying like lord of the rings which was such a massive success because it was a good story and all it took was it being good to get a massive i was going to school i think i was at the seventh or eighth grade when the movies were really picking up i think and girls who i knew were not into fantasy were watching lord of the rings because uh the story was good the special effects was hidden and you had eye candy Win, win, win. When you turn something like Lord of the Rings or Dune, a massive epic with intense world building into like a big budget film, you are hoping to tap into the universality of it, you know? And with Lord of the Rings and with Dune, you have the advantage of someone who really cares and loves the source material working on it. Trusting the material to connect with an audience is the most important thing. And the truth is, audiences are more open-minded than we think if we just trust them. Generic fantasy is fun and it exists for a reason. But The Witcher isn't a generic fantasy series and neither are the books in A Song of Ice and Fire. They are all texts that are building upon tropes in the fantasy genre. They're not perfect. They're, they are still very male-centric, but there is depth there and i think it makes sense to modernize a show's cast to switch things around so that you can have more relevant female characters in the role you know in the case of yennefer she spent so much of her life doing her own 
thing rather than just spending time, you know, literally trying to sell a child to a Baba a God demon. So why not touch on all the things that we know that she would have dealt with on the way to finding a child or having her other relationships be developing while she's focusing on herself with Geralt. There are so many things that she could have been doing on the show for the season two besides be powerless and manipulating a literal child. How to reduce some of the solo monster of the week stuff that a show like this does need because it works when it has an episodic layer and an overarching storyline. Sometimes it doesn't feel like the show trusts the books. I mean, the amount of humor that's in the series of the books is just gone. Like two great examples that were just in this past season that did not get like shut at all was like the dear friend letter and how Geralt gets wrapped up in the whole traitor plot at Eretuza. Like in Blood of Elves, Geralt is writing to Yennefer and because he's an awkward dad, he spends like two days wondering how to start the letter. And then he decides to go with dear friend. And Yennefer responds with a letter that is so passive aggressive so biting that it truly made me fall in love with her all over again. Dear friend, your unexpected letter, which I received not quite three years after we last saw each other, has given me much joy. My joy is all the greater as various rumors have been circulating about your sudden and violent death. It is a good thing that you have decided to disclaim them by writing to me. It is a good thing too that you are doing so so soon. From your letter it appears that you have lived a peaceful wonderfully boring life devoid of all sensation. These days such a life is a real privilege dear friend and I am glad that you have managed to achieve it. I was touched by the sudden concern which you deigned to show as to my health dear friend. I hasten with the news that, yes, I now feel well. The period of indisposition is behind me. I have dealt with the difficulties, the description of which I shall not bore you with. It worries and troubles me very much that the unexpected present you received from fate brings you worries. Your supposition that this requires professional help is absolutely correct. Although your description of the difficulty, quite understandably, is enigmatic and I am sure I know the source of the problem. And I agree with your opinion that the help of yet another magician is absolutely necessary. I feel honored to be the second to whom you turn. What have I done to deserve to be so high on your list? Rest assured, my dear friend, and if you have the intention of supplicating the help of additional magicians, abandon it because there is no need. I leave without delay and go to the place with which you indicated in an oblique yet, to me, understandable way. It goes without saying that I leave in absolute secrecy and with great caution. I will surmise the nature of the trouble on the spot and will do all that is in my power to calm the gushing source. I shall try, in so doing, not to appear any worse than other ladies to whom you have turned, are turning, or usually turn with your supplications. I am, after all, your dear friend. Your valuable friendship is too important to me to disappoint you, dear friend. Should you, in the next few years, wish to write me, do not hesitate for a moment. Your letters invariably give me boundless pleasure. Your friend, Yennefer. And what do they do on the show? They play it totally straight and for typical romantic angst. Dear friend, if our time at Camoran proved anything, it's that the world is changing. Dear friend, even in your silence, I know you're wondering how Ciri's training is progressing. She has great potential. It seems that you and Siri are thoroughly enjoying our fourth house in as many months. Then in Time of Contempt, the reason why Geralt is caught uh, when all of the, you know, Dijkstra's people are trying to fish out the traitor at Eretuza, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's 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 really not that interesting. There's a storyline in which Dijkstra, who is from another nation, is thinking that there is a traitor in the Brotherhood of Sorcerers. He and his team, along with uh, Philippa, who is his his bestie for real, for real, decide that they're going to like round everyone up and figure out who the traitor is. And Geralt is not involved with this because he don't do that. But he gets caught up in it because he has to pee. <laughs> and he's too much of a gentleman to pee when Yennefer is in the room with him. So he goes 
to pee in a potted plant outside. <laughs> and that's why he gets spotted. It was just, which is like so much funnier than what they did in the books. And it's just so Geralt. Like Geralt in the books is such an awkward turtle duck sometimes. He has like adult Zuko energy sometimes. Just like doing the weirdest, most awkward things. Like he's like a, like a gentleman philosopher, but massive dork. There are so many moments where plot things happen in the books because people just need to use the bathroom or like their bodily functions are betraying them. And it's my favorite thing. And I think what's so tragic to me is that so much of the discourse around The Witcher is always focused on the cast, the hyperfixation on feminism and progressive identity in the writer's room. When it's like, we can just say that as an adaptation, it isn't working. It does not have to be this whole woke women's issue. We have seen across multiple writer's room, people who just do not get how to adapt a fantasy series. It's not an issue of gender or race. It's a fantasy issue of people trying to make a profitable show in 2023. We're using diversity to market a show, but the writer's room is still hella white. We are gonna make weird changes around consent and motivation to give characters depth while also never dealing with the implications of those decisions issue. You know, fantasy is profitable sometimes. It's also expensive if you wanna do it well. And, I, and obviously the wig budget is struggling because Philippa is taking up so much of it with her amazing looks. And if the only way they can get people comfortable making these projects is to strip it of any of the actual narrative complexity across multiple franchises, then what we are seeing is not diversity or feminism ruining these shows. It's capitalism. It's always capitalism. Capitalism is the reason why something like The Hobbit gets made the way it did. I mean, think of The Hobbit. <laughs> think of The Hobbit, a, a three-parter that literally introduced a female elf because like there's only like two, three women. They're like, we have to put another woman in The Hobbit. We'll make a woman. We'll just, you know, go through our binder, grab a redhead, put it on the ground. And then the studio literally brings in that little anti-vaxxer wasp girl and it's like, okay, you are gonna be something Than L. And originally she's gonna be like a regular elf girl. And then what does the studio say? We need a love triangle. In order to take this job, you have to promise me I will not be in a love triangle. I swear to God, this is what I said to them. And they said, we promise you, you won't be in a love triangle. Came back in 2012 for reshoots. And they were like, ah, uh, the studio I would really like to see. And I was like, here we go. Capitalism, baby. Because if it's not gonna cost a billion dollars and make us a billion dollars, what is the point? The point is that fantasy isn't always made or written to be a billion dollar franchise, especially if they're not supposed to be subversing or interesting. Like The Witcher, I'm glad it was made. Like there's definitely stuff to enjoy about the show. And I definitely think for anyone who loves the show and that's their shit and they just want it to be their shit, God bless. You know, like I'm not saying you have to hate the show or anything like that. Uh, to me, it's like, it's trailed off a little bit, especially with the whole stuff around Henry Cavill. That has also been another issue to it as well as like this idea of either trying to make Henry Cavill the, the poster child for you know male gamers in the derogatory and positive ways and i'm just like that's a lot to put on a person who just wants to leave an adaptation of a show that he may not like anymore like sometimes people just leave shows he's also like nearing 40 if not 40 and has been on multiple big projects like maybe he doesn't want to be something he doesn't fully enjoy anymore and that's okay but all of those things are part of why we can't just enjoy things because everything has to be oh, these women with their stupid woman stuff are ruining fantasy. And it's just, it's just not true. The adaptation does not hold up entirely, but it's for reasons of capitalism output. Netflix wants to make money. That's why the first season, what was, how did they promote that show? Henry Cavill's abs. Henry Cavill's abs is what made The Witcher what it is. I'm just tired of this weird ability. And I know it's gonna continue, because I'm seeing you guys do it with Castlevania Nocturne, which on my uh, surprise second channel, did a little rant about that because y'all are ridiculous. Get help. <sighs> but yeah, I think we're living in a really interesting period where we're seeing fantasy being used as a way to make money because Game of Thrones showed that it could make money. But rather than learn the actual lessons, which is that like a well-made interesting genre show can be successful if it's given an opportunity by a really good company that takes the time with it. I mean, don't forget, they filmed two pilots of Game of Thrones to make sure that it really worked when they actually put the money behind it. Like it 
went through massive casting changes, so many things. Like that show had work put into it. If you're not willing to put in that kind of work to really give your showrunners room and to actually trust an audience, you know, I think one of the things that's so important to understand about great TV is that it has to trust that the audience will go on the journey with them. When they decided in the episode called, I think it's called College. I think it's, I think it's episode five or seven of The Sopranos to have Tony Soprano murder a man while at the same time taking his young daughter on her college tour they were afraid that it would turn people off because he was a murderer now but people love him because people love a good story and if you tell a good story that's what matters and people of color are not here just to be your marketing linchpin so that you can throw us in the into Twitter discourses and get black people and brown people to support this work just because we're tired of the harassment. Because that's what ends up happening. Rather than black and brown people having more of a voice in how diversity and marketing happens, we end up having to fight these little tiny wars of social media terrorism against these, these people who dislike us inherently rather than actually going to have a conversation of what it feels like to see companies constantly take black bodies, brown bodies, throw them into the line of fire and then be saying, look how we change the paradigm. Look how we care about diversity. We are changing beauty standards. All this to say, will someone please adapt Tamara Pierce's work so that we can have some good fucking food. When the pandemic happened, as it happened to a lot of people, I developed terrible anxiety to the point where I started taking medication for it for the first time. My mental health improved, but my physical health started to change. And earlier this year, I was diagnosed as being on my way to being pre-diabetic, just like my cat. Since I got that diagnosis, I've been working really hard to try and find ways to get healthy in a way that honored my own principles. I didn't want a quick fix. I didn't want some diet that wasn't going to stay. And I also wanted to make sure that I wasn't reinforcing fat phobia while I was working out and needed accountability on top of all of that. And while I've been on that journey, I had started Pilates and Copilot had reached out to me. Copilot is an affordable fitness coach app that provides you a way to help meet your goals while giving you a real life coach to talk about and help you on your journey working with your schedule. My trainer, Brooke, and I talked about the fact that I come from a background of semi-disordered eating and I didn't want to bring any of that into my training. It was important to me that the people behind the scenes knew that those are my principles, that they had a diverse amount of training options, that the goals of the company were to help you feel good about yourself because fitness looks different depending on who you are and what you want out of it. And I was really encouraged by the way that the test happens when you sign up for Copilot, that the questions they ask you are about your deeper goals and not just about your body or not just about your weight. Because I travel a bit for work and for different conventions, I was also very grateful that Brooke was able to work around my schedule. I also really enjoyed that there was a way to give instant feedback with the chats. When I started doing my workouts, I was using five pound weights. And because I've been doing Pilates for a while, I am a little bit stronger now so I was able to increase them to 15 really easily in addition to your regular workouts there's also a section called extras which you can use to sort of supplement different things which I enjoy because while I have my one fixed day I want to slowly go up to more fixed days I'm finally working out nearly three times a week the sponsor requires you to take five classes beforehand and I really appreciate that because it forced me into the gym to do what I wanted to do and reminded me that I do actually enjoy working out when it feels like it's for me. And what I like about Copilot is that it feels like it's for you. And over 75% of Copilot's clients continue to work out after 100 days, which is nine times more successful than a lot of other apps doing the exact same thing. And I can see why. It is flexible, it is engaging, the people are kind. And I also think that it's important to recognize that your goals will change, that the important thing is finding something that is long-term effective for you. And sometimes it's hard to do that alone. I love my body. I have, even though I have gained weight, I embrace that. I just want to not have pain anymore. And I want to not have diabetes because I cannot afford that. So working out is both a way for me to love myself 
and take care of myself at the same time. Click on my co-pilot link to get a 14 day free trial with your own fitness expert and health coach. Try it out, see if it's for you. And I definitely think that if it's something that you've been thinking about, doing it in a way that feels authentic to you is the most important thing. And having options is what helps. And Copilot delivers a bevy of options. Once again, you can click on the Copilot link down below to get a 14 day free trial with your own expert and fitness coach. Try it out for yourself. I don't think you'll be disappointed.